gospel according to John, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. Now the next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples, and he watched Jesus walk by. He exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. To join me now in a word of prayer. Father, we give you thanks for your word. Your word that calls us from death to life, from silence to speech, from idleness to action. Renew us, transform us once again. The living word in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. When I think about our text uh, from the first chapter of John, I'm mindful of the uh, movie Shrek that maybe some of you saw some years ago. And I can still remember uh, my daughter Kaylee and one of our favorite lines out of that movie, of the movie Shrek. And it was a conversation with a donkey and ogre, uh, Shrek being an ogre. And Shrek says to donkey, ogres are like onions, right? They have lots of layers. And I think about onions and I think about layers. That's the gospel according to John. John is functioning at different layers. And we have this gorgeous piece of scripture with us today out of the first chapter of John. And here's what I think is happening in that text. At one level, we hear this narrative, this travel narrative, and they are proceeding from day to day to day. And at another layer, of course, the early church is synthesized, is putting this together for us centuries afterwards. On another layer, we literally have every day of the creation back in Genesis day one, day two, day three, day four, all the way through day seven, in one chapter, including the beginning of chapter two, the new creation, which we see revealed in the wedding at Cana. This marvelous text. And this, of course, is a text for epiphany. This is the season of the church year that we're in. It's the season of epiphany, which I love the season of epiphany, because many of you know I am definitely a fourth lap learner. Many of you know this. Uh, you have survived with me. You've come to appreciate me. Uh, you know, my, you know my, my strong suits and my weak suits. I am definitely a fourth lap learner. And I don't beat myself over the head. You just sort of learn these things and realize it's who you are, right? And I've functioned that way my whole life. And you learn to have some patience with yourself. It uh, happens all the time. And epiphany is that text, that time for fourth lap learners. It's a time of revelation. And we hear in this travel monologue, this conversation uh, with Jesus, and they're on the road with two of the disciples. And Jesus asks Andrew and Peter, what are you looking for? You think about that sense of revelation. What are you looking for? This happens all the time in my life. I'll give you a simple example. I was at Fleet Farm maybe uh, three and a half weeks ago or so. Snowy day, not a good day to be out, but I had to go to Fleet Farm. I can't even remember why, but going to Fleet Farm is always a good excuse. And so going to Fleet Farm. And here's the deal, I can thank my father for this, I tend to always park in the back acres of any place that I go, right? So when I'm at Fleet Farm, I'm way back there in the back lots, and I park and I come in at a bit of a frantic, buying something, snowing furiously outside, 
and I'm done, and it's time to go back, I get out of the doors of Fleet Farm, and I can't remember where, where, where I've parked the car. And so, you know what I'm doing? I go out to the back 40 of Fleet Farm out there. I mean, because it's snowing, the wind's picking up the whole thing in the yards. I've got the fob like this, I'm not doing this, walking down like this. I'm sure I looked a little strange to be like, what's this guy doing, right? And, and lo and behold, I find somebody else who's walking down the lane just like this with their fob doing the same thing. I'm like, I'm in good company, another fourth lap learner who can't find their car, right? And it comes to the point where it's just becoming ridiculous. I mean, I really can't find the car. And, and I finally say to myself, I'm getting cold. So I come back in to Fleet Farm, right? And, and I, I sit down. And I say, okay, just take a deep breath, Mark. And I take a deep breath. And I said, what door did you come in? And I walked out the same door that I came in. And lo and behold, right there, not in the back 40, but right there in the very front of Fleet Farm is my vehicle, right? And it's this epiphanic moment, right, where it's like revelation. There it is, right? It's sinking in. And there's the vehicle. And Epiphany's like, Jesus, as he has these two would-be disciples on the road, he asks them this question. What are you looking for? And, And here's the deal this morning, as we have the opportunity in Epiphany to reflect on these texts, only you can really answer that question that our Lord asks you. What are you looking for? And it's interesting what our Lord says next. He invites them. And he says, come and see. Come and see. Come and see. Interesting word with that invitation, come. Come, that sense of come, always necessitates the aspect of leaving. Think about it. This morning, as you journeyed here for church... It meant leaving your house or your apartment, right? You had to get out on the road and drive, and hopefully it was a a pretty good drive for you. But it necessitates leaving. It necessitates leaving sometimes the ordinary. It sometimes necessitates leaving our comfort zones. But nonetheless, it is the invitation of Jesus. Come. Come and see. And Epiphany, I think, is that opportunity for us to step back and attempt to answer that question. What are you looking for? And as we wrestle with that question in our faith, hear the words of Jesus. Come and see. And one of the ways I would like us to think about that aspect of of coming to be with Jesus is worship. What we're doing here this morning. And oftentimes in my ministry, I've had people ask that question and say, you know, Pastor... Why do I actually need to to come to worship on a Sunday morning, right? My schedule is already way too busy. I mean, there's hockey tournaments to go to. I've got to work. I've got to shop. I've got a myriad of things that I could be doing on a Sunday morning. Why is worship so important? Why is that such a tangible and important thing for me to even consider to contemplate? Let me share a story with you. Oftentimes in my ministry, I have the opportunity to, to be with people of all ages and all places in their life. Let me fast forward you for just one second if you'll let me do this. Let me take you to the very end of your life. And here's the deal. Oftentimes when I'm at nursing homes or care facilities, I get to be with people in the last years of their life. Right? And obviously that can happen in a lot of different ways. But oftentimes I'll meet two kinds of people. I will meet people that have come to the last years in their life where they're still hanging on to material possessions. They're still hanging on to old fights that happened a long time ago. They're still holding on to old family system stuff they just can't release. And it's a sad thing as they age. Especially when they think about approaching their death. The other kind of person that I run into is the kind of person who's realized throughout the entire lifetime you think about these two little ones are going to be baptized here together today. You think about that lifetime and what that might look like for them. And it's interesting, the span of your lifetime. That other kind of person is the kind of person that realizes, you know what? At that point in my life, it's not about material possessions. It's not about how much money 
I, I received in my lifetime. It's not, about, it's not about how much stuff I had. It's not about any of that. You know what it's about? It's about relationships. And more importantly, all some of those relationships at that point in life, people have died. But it's most pronounced by the eternal relationship that we have in God through Christ Jesus. And it's amazing to me as I minister to those people, especially in the age bracket, oftentimes when we're 13, we may think about worship as a have to, but it's amazing how later in life it's not a have to anymore, it's a get to. You know what? I've learned in my ministry, it doesn't happen automatically. It doesn't. It's like any relationship in life that is worthy of our time, God and our relationship with Christ is no different. It takes time with God. It takes time with Jesus. To know God and to know Jesus. And worship is that important time that God carves out in our life every week to take time and to be with God in Christ Jesus. So what are you looking for? What are you looking for? And you have to square that up. You have to answer that question. But here again the words of Jesus. Come. Come. It's the gentle invitation of our Lord come and behold come and see as we gather here together this day for worship our Lord is here our Lord is with us in the elements of bread and wine as we receive our Lord in the Holy Communion our Lord is with us as we baptize these children today in the waters of baptism our Lord is with us today as the word is proclaimed into our ears and into our hearts but dear friend of mine who grew up in a Swedish covenant tradition and I love this tradition because in their tradition, one of the questions that they periodically ask one another is this question, and it's a wonderful question. How is your walk going with the Lord? How is your walk with the Lord? And that's faith. That's the relationship that we have with God each and every day. And worship as we gather every week to be fed, to be nourished, to grow in our relationship with God in Christ Jesus, where all of a sudden, you know what? Jesus is no stranger. Jesus is our Lord, our Master, our friend, who walks with us through everything that life will throw at you, from the valleys to the mountaintops and everything in between. And that last day, as we approach the twilight of our days on this earth, when all those other things are gone. Jesus is still there. And that eternal relationship that we have in God through Christ Jesus becomes the most important thing. The most important thing. So during this season of Epiphany, may we have the eyes to see Christ. May, may we have the heart to feel, to feel the energy of the Spirit. And may God give us the courage in our minds and our bodies to follow wherever Christ may lead us. Thanks be to God.